And thank you so much for the introduction. Unfortunately, I will not be talking too much about um, I'm about uh, pancreatic cancer, but I will be telling you a little bit about the progress that I've made in my project so far. So as Axa mentioned, the technology that I'll be focusing on is imaging mass cytometry or IMC for short. So IMC allows us to quantify close to 40 proteins simultaneously. And how it does that is it, it makes use of metal conjugated antibodies and essentially is a laser ablation system coupled to a time of light mass cytometer. What you get at the end of IMC is this high dimensional image where all these sort of stacks that you see correspond to a different protein measured in the experiment. A couple of advantages of using such a technology over fluorescence based methods are these metal tags that since these have distinct mass, it allows us to quantify so many proteins at the same time since they have very little signal overlap uh, in comparison to, for example, fluorophores that often have a lot of um, overlapping signals. Another point here is that these metal tags correspond to rare earth metals that despite their name are actually quite abundant in the earth's crust, but they're so-called because they're not present in biological uh, material. And therefore you also don't get that all fluorescence issue that you do with fluorophores. Crucially, IMC gives us single cell and even subcellular resolution while retaining spatial information. So once we have our IMC image, and here I'm showing you one of the images um, from IMC with some of the channels shown here, a very a thing to do next is to now identify the position of single cells within this image, a process known as cell segmentation. Many algorithms such as cell profiler, elastic, and more recently deep cell have been developed for this purpose. So for example, in this image, these purple little regions that you see correspond to different pixels belonging to the same cell and the outlines, the white outlines denote the cell boundaries. So once we have our IMC image and the single cells, what we can do, what a common step next step is to then use these to cluster the single cells to identify communities of cells. And how it's often done is by using popular community detection algorithms such as Louvain, or phenograph, which is a high dimensional clustering algorithm, or sorry, rather clustering algorithm for high dimensional data uh, to identify these, com these communities of cells. But what I want to sort of drive home here is that up until this point, most studies have only made use of single cell mean protein expression. And as I will show you, IMC can give us so much more than that. So here again, we have an IMC image with this corresponding cell segmentation mask. And I'm going to zoom in just a little bit in this one region. And I'm only showing the DNA and e coherent channels for simplicity. Now, notice how IMC has pixel level information for all of these channels. Now, I can do what we've done previously, where I can take the average across all these pixels to get their mean protein expression within single cells. But notice, and I don't know how well you can see this, but in many of the cells, DNA and e coherent don't co localize. And that's expected, right? Because DNA is a nuclear marker where the is more commonly found is on the cell membrane or the cell cytoplasm. And since these pixels are spatially resolved, their expression patterns should reflect that. So what I can do is take correlations between these pixel values to get a protein-protein co-localization score. Further, using these sort of outlines, again, the white outlines denote know the cell boundaries, I can use these uh, region properties to get, for example, how big the cell is, how elongated it is, et cetera. But I can also do it for all of the cells in the image. I can get the cell's neighbors and repeat the analysis for them to get its spatial context. So these four things that I've mentioned, protein mean expression, cell morphology, protein subcellular localization, and spatial context are what I'll be calling the four views of IMC data. So the question becomes, how do we integrate these four views to learn rich cellular states associated with disease? And that one potential answer is that if we treat each of these views as a different mode of data, this becomes a multimodal data integration problem. And VAEs or radiation autoencoders have been used a lot for this purpose. So a very general architecture of VAEs is they, they consist of two neural networks, an encoder and a decoder. The encoder is the one that takes in your high dimensional input and then learns a lower dimensional latent space representation, which then the decoder samples from and tries to reconstruct the data. Such VAEs have been used for single cell RNA-seq data and also uh, how it relates to me is that they've been used to multimodal data, for example, for site seq 
And this learned latent space has been used for things like dimensionality reduction, visualization, and data integration. And what makes them so popular is that they're nonlinear models that are scalable to large data sets and they allow for the integration of multimodal data. So the objective for my talk uh, has been to develop, use um, VAEs to develop computational tools that can extract and integrate the four views I and C that I mentioned to get to learn novel cell states. So as I start, this is again, I'm showing another IMC image that has a segmented single cell. I pull out one of the cells and here different, the different colors correspond to the different proteins. And I can do what I did, what I mentioned earlier, where I can take the, I can average the values, the pixel values across all the pixels that belong to a single cell to get the first cell mean protein expression, but I can correlate the values as well to get the first cell protein for localization. Uh, I can use standard image processing uh, libraries such as Scikit Image from Python to get their morphology features, such as area, size, perimeter, centricity, things like that. And then I can also identify a cell's nearest neighbors and repeat the analysis for them to get a cell's spatial context. So these four views form the inputs to my model, which I'm calling highly multiplex imaging, variation autoencoder, or HMIVAE. So this is a general layout of how my model works is that again, it takes in the four views as input and at the encoder stage, it first learns a separate embedding from each of the inputs. These separate embeddings are then concatenated and then a joint latent space is learned for all of them, for all of the cells. And then what follows the decoder that again tries to sample from that latent space and then tries to reconstruct the input and how well the model does is monitored by an evidence lower bound function and so once we've learned a latent space that we're fairly happy with, uh, I can use this, these lower dimensional latent features to then cluster and visualize the cells, but I can take it a step further. I can place them back into the tissue and do some neighborhood enrichment analysis to see are some of the clusters, do they tend to you know, uh, correspond more closely with others? Then you know, are they depleted for some, are they enriched for others? And where clinical data is available, I can combine them with that data to, do, to figure out whether any of the clusters that I've identified carry any prognostic potential. So I have applied my model on two breast cancer IMT data sets. One is the Basel cohort from the Jackson et al. 2020 paper, paper, and the other one is the Metabrick cohort from the Alley 2020 paper. And what's cool about these data sets is that they're very similar in terms of their antibody panel, and both of them have clinical data available. So concurrently with running my model, of course, your model is, has to be better than the state of the art. And so I've also been uh, running these data sets on with phenographs to see how much, just to compare how much better my model is doing, what is something that we're finding in the phenograph isn't and vice versa. And what I found is that in comparison to phenograph, so here you see a heat map with the cluster IDs on the X axis and the features on the Y axis and the colors correspond to the T value. And what we're seeing is that HMID is actually able to find clusters that is that are informed by all of the views that went into the model. Whereas phenograph, most of the clusters are only defined by their expression or co-localization features. So if I could draw your attention to two of these clusters, cluster seven and five, I went ahead and looked at patient data to see whether or not these were prognostic at, 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 at all. So what I found was that patients who had a high prevalence of cell cluster seven cells in their uh, in their image had a better survival than those that held, had a lower uh, prevalence. Similar, and then for cluster five, patients that had a low prevalence of cluster cell uh, cluster five cells in their image had a better uh, better survival. And I was also able to find a two clusters from the basal cohort um, that were, that seemed to be um, were, that their their low presence in their cell uh, clusters they tended to be, um, have a better survival for, especially for patients that had um, the hormone negative subtype. So these two clusters have some sort of relationship with this, and like despite taking into account these clinical variables, these clusters are still prognostic. And so some next steps is to test the integration capability of HMI uh, As I mentioned earlier, Metabrick and Basel largely share a very similar antibody panel design. And so one thing to do is to train my model on one of the data sets and see how well it's able to capitulate the clusters from the other data set. Um, and also just compare the clusters in general between the two. Um, Metabrick has combined genomics data. And so what I can do is and see whether these clusters represent some interesting genomic patterns. 
Um, and then to since you have published data sets, I have certain cell types that were found previously, and I can check the overlap with those subtypes. Uh, next is to summarize neighborhood enrichment, see how well we're able to capture that spatial context, um, and then also to test different architectures of the model. The linear decoder tends, uh, uh, different studies have shown the linear decoder tends to have a more interpretable latent space. That's something to test. Um, and then also incorporating different technical um, effects. Since IMC, people have different slides and they all represent different technical variations. So can we take that into account and improve the clusters that we find? And then finally, it is to release HMIV as part of a suite of single cell analysis tools called SPDI tools and in the future. So with that, I'd like to thank my lab for their support, my collaborators and my community members, and of course, you all for listening. Okay,